So here's advice that my parents gave me that don't work well with a sermon. Um, it was dad, don't worry mom. Um, but uh, I remember my dad telling me before a sporting event or before a, a competition of some sort, he would always say, hey, somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose. Might as well be you that wins. And I, and I used to take that to heart and be like, no, he's right. We're going to go and we're going to play this game. Somebody's going to win. Why shouldn't it be me, right? I, no one wants to be the guy. Who, so I kind of went into everything thinking, okay, you have to be the greatest and because somebody's got to be the best in the class. Somebody's got to be the strongest. Somebody's got to be the best. doesn't always work out, though. And when it doesn't happen, I was like, well, I guess it was that guy who gets to be the greatest. And, and, uh, but uh, um, you all all heard of Muhammad Ali, correct? And what was his saying that you would always say? Yeah, y'all can say it. Yeah, I am the greatest, right? And, and he would champion that. I am the greatest. And, and anyone that challenged him, he would prove them wrong. And he really was probably the greatest boxer that ever lived. Maybe some debate about Mike Tyson. I don't know. It doesn't matter here nor there. But during his time, Muhammad Ali, he made that claim and he backed it up. And, and it's hard to argue that during his time that he wasn't the greatest boxer that ever lived. And, and uh, so... So he had this mantra that I am the greatest. That's how he thought of himself. And, and, but he had to prove that, you know. He had to go out and actually um, go in through fights, and he had to prove that he was the greatest. People challenged the fact of whether or not he was the greatest, and he had to prove it again and again. Then, then you get into the, the disciples, right? And it's kind of interesting how the disciples, one thing they have in common with Muhammad Ali is the disciples come to Jesus, and they're not so sure about it. They're not claiming it, but they want it. And so they say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, which one of us is going to be the greatest, right, James and John? Which one of us is going to be the greatest when you come into your kingdom? Which of one of us is going to be the best there is? And Jesus looks at him, and he's all confused. Which one of you is going to be the greatest? Is that, is that what you're seeking after? You want your fame, your fortune, you, your notoriety, right? You, is this really what you want? Have you not been following me now for three years, and you're still asking the question, which one of us is going to be the greatest? And they don't even know what it is that they're saying. When you come into your glory, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, Jesus, when you, when you start to really shine, Jesus, and, and show who you are, which one of us is going to be the one who stands at your right side and at your left side? You can imagine Jesus just shaking his head at him going, you have no idea what you're talking about or what you're asking. When I am at my greatest, the one at my right side and the one on my left side will be two thieves. Is that what you want, really? He says, don't worry, you'll have your time. You will drink of the cup of which I drink. You will be baptized by the baptism of which I was baptized, meaning you will suffer, you will be persecuted, and you will die. Be careful what you ask for. Have you ever thought about that? When is God, when is Jesus most godlike? throughout all the scriptures, throughout his life here on earth? You ever wondered, when did Jesus display and you went, surely that is God? How could you deny it? Look at what's going on there. When was Jesus most godlike throughout his life here on earth? Perhaps for a lot of y'all, you will say something along the lines of the transfiguration. You know that story when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration and he, his clothes turned bright white and he shined. He's so bright that you, no one could even stand to, to look at him. Moses and Elijah appeared. The Heavenly Father spoke and said, this is my son. Listen to him. Surely that's when Jesus was most godlike, when he showed brightly the, the aura of God himself, right? That's when he's most godlike. Or maybe you think it's another time. Maybe, maybe you're thinking when he walked on water, right? Something I tried to do when I was a kid, swimming. You try to run real fast and walk on water, just a fun way to jump in a pool, right? You can't do it. None of us can walk on water. And, and here Jesus just walked on water, has total control of all creation, tells the wind and the waves to quiet, and it quiets down. Maybe, maybe those moments is when Jesus is most godlike, when he can kind of manipulate and control all the world and creation, and it, it, it does at its whim, Right? Maybe that's when Jesus is most godlike. You say, there, surely that is God himself. 
Or, or maybe it's when he raises Lazarus from the dead. I mean, who can make a dead person all of a sudden come alive? Or Jarius' daughter, he tells her to go uh, get up and she gets up. Or, or heals the sick or casts out demons and throws them into swines and puts them over a cliff. Maybe those moments and when Jesus is conquering death and the devil himself, surely that's when Jesus is most godlike. But what if I told you that none of those answers is actually probably the right event to choose from? They're all good. What if I told you that Jesus was most godlike when he was helpless on a cross and there were people nailing him to the wood and taking his life? You would say, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense. That's when he was most human-like, not when he was most God-like. That doesn't make any sense at all to say that, that Jesus was most God-like when he had no control and, and that seemingly he had all of his control and even his life stripped away from him. But I would argue that that is exactly when Jesus was most God-like because that is exactly why Jesus came into this world to begin with. As he says several times throughout the gospel, he says what? It is necessary that I come and suffer and die. Peter says, surely it is not so. Surely you will not suffer and die. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Who in the world would ever say something like that? That is the most important thing. That is the only reason that I am here. And Jesus was most godlike there on the cross. If you want to know what God looks like, look at the picture of Jesus on the cross. For that is when he came and he died, and not just for no reason, but he came and he did it for you. And that's what makes him God-like. He did it not so he can be glorified, but so that you may have life and that you may be glorified in heaven. Jesus came to serve you, to sacrifice all things for you, to give up all things for you. And in that doing, he so showed himself to be God. And here James and John walk up and they're like, which of us can be the greatest? And they're so far from God in that question, they don't even realize it. And so Jesus answers and he responds to them, right? He says to them, he goes, look, kings of the Gentiles, they exercise lordship. You want to be like the kings of all the other nations, the pagans that do not worship God, that do not know me or anyone or, or, or my father in heaven? Is that who you want to be like? You want to be this king that walks around and demands people bow down to you and worship you and, and serve you at every need that you would ever have? He says, is that what you're looking for? You want to be that kind of greatest? He says, not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest. It is hard being the youngest in the family, just so you all know, because they're always seen as the least of the family. It's just part of it. Any other youngest in here? I appreciate you all. I feel you. I see you. I get it. We also know how to manipulate really well. Um, so Jesus says, rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest. The youngest were always seen as the one who serves, the one who has to uh, um, um, help out. And it was funny, I was talking to one of our members, who I won't say who it was, but is going to the men's retreat. They're staying at a hotel, three very large members, okay, tall, like really tall. You all figured it out. But uh, and I was talking to him, it's like, so how are you all going to sleep in a two-bed um, hotel room and he's like man I gotta sleep on the floor and I was like why and he goes because I'm the youngest <laughs> and I was like I get it man I've been there um, so but whoever um, wants to he goes not so among you whoever wants to become the greatest right you must become like as the youngest as the leader who serves or who is the greater the one who reclines at the table and the one who has people coming to him, serving them, waiting on every need, is that the one who's the greatest or the one who serves? In our world, taking my fatherly advice that I give to my own children, says, hey, somebody's got to lose, might as well not be you, right? Somebody's got to be the best, might as well be you. Taking that fatherly advice, the greatest is the one who does what? wins at all costs. The greatest is the one who has all things. The greatest is the one who is served at all moments or, and as opposed to the opposite. 
or who's greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? We would obviously say the one who reclines at the table who has servants, but he says, it is not the one who reclines at the table. He says, look at me, I am among you as the one who serves. He says, so look at me. So we look at Jesus and we say, well, what is it that makes Jesus the greatest? And it's the fact that Jesus was willing to serve and to die and to suffer for you. Did he have to? Oh, he's God. He could have done what he wanted. He could have walked off that cross and said, I'm really not into this. But he didn't because he is the greatest. Because when he looked at his creation, whom he loves so much, when he looks at you, whom he loves so much, he was willing to die for you. Because his love is that great. As we talk about grow, unite, serve, and share, when we talk about serving our neighbors and serving our community, one of the questions that I often think about is, why? Why would we serve? If you're one who celebrates uh, Darwinian uh, 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 evolutionary theories, right, you would, you would probably go so far as to say, actually, service and sacrifice do nothing but harm you. If it's all survival of the fittest, and whoever's the strongest and whoever's the fittest is going to survive, so why would you ever help someone else grow stronger or grow more fit? Because that's just competition to your own survivability. You would never want to do that, serve your neighbor. In fact, the more your neighbor's downtrodden, the better you have a chance to go up, right? There can only be one winner. Might as well be you. And you can't win if you're going to help your competition. But not so with you, my friends in Christ. As Jesus himself lives in you, as Jesus himself lives in you, why do you serve? Because you carry the nature of God and God showed his power and strength and might, not through being the greatest, as Muhammad Ali would say, but by being the greatest in giving everything for you, for me, for those who do not deserve it. So why do we serve? Not because in our service we can show that our worthiness is there for God to love us. That's not why. We can't sit there and, and tally up our marks and say, oh, look, I crossed the threshold. Heaven is now mine. I did what I needed to do. That's not how it works. That threshold is so high you could never get there in the first place. And then you would drive yourself crazy and then despair trying to get there, even if you could. But God's love is found in mercy and compassion. His strength is found in the fact that he gives himself to you. And our strength is found in our ability to give of ourselves to others. And you will know the strength of God himself. Not in how much you accomplish here on earth, but in how much you serve your neighbor and love them. Because that's the nature of God. That's the very heart of who God is. It's the very heart of which, of that, of why Jesus came into this world. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for all. This peace which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds on Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.